Hello, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 1 of EKU Voices, a conversation with Eastern Kentucky University's alumni and friends, brought to you by the Office of Development and Alumni Relations in collaboration with the Department of Communication. I'm Carrie Lewis, Director of Special Projects and Development. And I'm Brady McBride, a senior here at EKU. And we are bringing you this podcast from the Department of Communication podcast studio on the Campus Beautiful here in Richmond, Kentucky. We are back for Season 2. I have a brand new co-host. Got big shoes to fill I'm for sure. You what, Brady McBride, I'm really glad that you're here. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Um, Andrew Poulter, who was my co-host host last season, um, he took another job. I'm going to say hey to Andrew because I know <laughs> he's going to listen. He told me he was going to listen to every episode. Um, but yes, he, he, moved, he moved on, which you know is great for him. I'm happy for him. Um, but that gave me the opportunity to get a brand new co-host, which Very I'm super true. excited about. And kind of my thinking on that was that I wanted to get a student in communications who was interested in podcasting, um, who obviously had affinity for EKU. Um, and so Brady was kind of the first person to respond to me. So <laughs> hey. here we are. Hey, early bird gets the worm. That's exactly right. Uh, so, you know, Brady, kind of like tell the people out there a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm Brady McBride. I grew up in Richmond, um, what they what people call a Richmondite here on campus. Um, I went to Madison Central High School here in Richmond. Decided to come to Eastern, just like my mom, my dad, my uncle, my aunt, my brother. I've got a huge family, most Eastern grads. Um, and I got into uh, the Department of Communications because my mom, my dad, my uncle all public relations majors, so uh, continuing following in their footsteps. Well, and like I said, podcasting is just another aspect mm-hmm. of that whole thing. So, you know, yet you're kind of like a legacy. Right? Basically, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on campus. Of course, like all good things um, that we do on this podcast, uh, you know, and to kind of initiate you into the very first episode, we had to have... A pre-production meeting, of course, at Purdy's, of course, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's the, it's the it's the place to be. It's a place to be in downtown Richmond, um, especially in the mornings. Very true. Yes. Very true. So of course, uh, I had my standard black coffee as I normally do down there, and uh, Brady had some what I call go-go juice. Yeah, I went with a latte, and with it had an extra shot of espresso in it. Yes, had to get going uh, pretty early in the morning. Because Students just. Love caffeine. Exactly. And not only are you, you know, a communications student, you're doing all that stuff, you're podcasting, you know, uh, but you also work at the rec center and you have to be there pretty early. Five o'clock. If you come in early, you're probably going to see me. See, so that's some responsibility right there. Very true. (laughs) Getting up at five o'clock in the morning to open up the rec center. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm I'm super glad to to have you on the show, like I said. Glad to be here. And uh, we're into fall. It's actually not been too bad. Uh, Andrew and I coined the term last season, uh, "fummer" when it was like 90 degrees out mm-hmm. in October. We may still get that, but it's been kind of nice. I'd rather be warm than hot. Or, uh, I'd rather be warm than cold, though. I sure. would, yeah. yeah. Our guest is shaking his head. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about that in a second <laughs> um, because I'm with you. There are times, there are times at last winter where I'm like, you know what? I might not get off on the Richmond exit. Yeah. I might just keep driving until I hit Key West and just leave the car, and, you know, I'll be back in the spring. <laughs> right. So I'm glad we're on the same page with that, definitely. Well, I am super, super excited to be bringing everybody some new EKU voices this season. Um, our first guest, I, I, I wrote an introduction, but his – his story, his background, what he's done in his life is just, I mean, I can't wait. I can't wait to talk to him. So let me go ahead and, and do his, his epic introduction that I have written. Um, in this episode, we are joined by an EKU alum that has had a really incredible career in for, the forensic explosives field. I'm telling you, this is a really, really interesting guy. A native of Manchester, Kentucky, he received his bachelor's degree in political science from EKU in 1969 and his master of science in forensic science from George Washington University. 
As a supervisory special agent in the FBI laboratory, he has traveled extensively throughout the United States and the world conducting bombing scene investigations, including the bombing of Pan Am American Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, and then the bombing deaths of a federal judge in Alabama and an attorney in Georgia in 1989. Prior to his retirement from the FBI in 1998, he was the chief of the FBI Bomb Data Center, whose responsibilities included the training of all public safety bomb disposal technicians in the United States. Returning to EKU as a professor in the College of Justice and Safety School of Safety, Security and Emergency Management, he has taught classes in the unique academic program, Fire, Arson, and Explosion Investigation. He is the author of Practical Bomb Scene Investigations, the first comprehensive work on the subject, a lecturer, a member of numerous professional organizations, and a 1992 inductee into the EKU Hall of Distinguished Alumni. We are very excited to be opening season two with him. Welcome, Tom Thurman. I am. Uh, thank you. you must have been talking about somebody else. <laughs> you know, that, that, that couldn't be me. I'm per- well, oh, you know yeah. what? Then the internet <laughs> steered me wrong, let me tell you. The Google machine uh, then give, gave me information about somebody uh, yeah. else. I don't I'm, know. I am uh, thrilled to be here, and, and that's, that's, that's an understatement. I, uh, I love EKU. I love talking about EKU. And uh, this is uh, this is certainly home. Well, we definitely, like I said, really, really appreciate you coming on with this. And and you know, uh, you are from from Manchester, Kentucky, which is kind of near here uh, in the Richmond area. Um, and you know, your dad was a you're kind of a legacy, right? A spider. No, dad's the legacy. Okay. I, I'm, I'm I'm just you know I'm just his son. You know? Spider Thurman was a yeah. uh, you know a uh, what's the word I'm looking for here a force on campus say uh dad, dad was uh a unique individual in in a lot of a lot of aspects um and, and unique in in that uh and, and in his in his lifetime I, I honestly never ever recalled him saying a bad description or a bad word or disgusting of any individual never ever. And people say, well, that, that can't be. And I said, well, well, I violate that most every day, but, uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> I said, dad, dad did that. And, and I would, I'd be fussing about something and, and he would say, son, you know, look at the other side of this, you know, that this person, you know, maybe not really understand what they're saying. And, and he always would, he would make a, not an excuse, but just say, Open up your horizons. You know, look beyond what you're hearing. And I, I just, Dad was absolutely my brother's and I hero. And you know, he's been gone a few years, and and my brother and I miss him and Mom terribly. Well, and he was an athlete. You know, he played football here. He played basketball. He ran track. Uh, he was he was in he was an administrator. But I got to ask you, how did he get the nickname Spider? That you know, uh, there, there's a there's a couple of stories. The the most famous story is that uh, he showed up in elementary school one day uh, with a whelp on the side of his face, and uh, they said, "Okay, well, what happened? I got bit by a spider." And so then it, it took. The, the, the other scenario is when he was in high school, he was such a good runner that uh, he was all over the field, very agile, uh, like a spider. So, okay, whichever one you want to take, uh, it, it, really, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> now, growing up in this household with somebody who's huge at EKU, did that spur you to go to EKU? Not, not really. Uh, because I only had one choice. Okay. Uh, first thing, am I going to college? Yes, you're going to college. So that choice is gone. Next thing, where are you going to college? You're going to, e- e- at that time, Eastern Kentucky State State College, and then ultimately became EKU. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have that choice either. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. And then the third one, what are you going to major in? Okay, that was the big choice. Mm-hmm. And, uh... But no, it it was it was always that I was going to college, uh, and it wasn't something that uh, I was against. I, I knew I had mm-hmm. to go to college, and it was and where I was going, I was going to Eastern, and I didn't have anything against that. I didn't I didn't want to go anyplace else. You know, I I, uh, um, I liked Eastern. 
Um, you know, going back in, in time here, uh, we moved. Uh, I grew up in Manchester until I was 15. And Dad was the basketball coach at, at Clay County High School and really made a name for the, the basketball pro- program at, uh, at Clay County High. But um, in 62, uh, Dr. Robert Martin uh, hired Dad as the first uh, full-time alumni director of EKU. So we moved to Richmond, and, and I was uh, dumbfounded. I, I thought, we're moving to the big city. Uh, <laughs> trust me, from Manchester to Richmond, that was a big city. <laughs> and so uh, I, I feel like I grew up in, in two towns. Richmond as, uh, as, as well as, as Manchester. And w- w- one little thing here, and let me diverge just a little bit. Sure. Great story. Absolutely. This is a well, that's what that's we're what all we about is great this, stories. This is, this is a great yeah, story. Yeah, I love it. And uh, dad, dad was a, a phenomenal athlete at Benham High School in, in Harlan County. And uh, he was recruited by the University of Kentucky. Um for a full football scholarship. Eastern tried to, uh, to recruit him, but Dad said, no, I, I want to go to UK. So out of high school, he goes to UK. Not a lot of people know this story. All right? so, I like it. So I like he, the exclusive. He goes, he goes to UK, and he gets over there, and it totally different time then than it was that it is today. That, okay, you're here. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, you make your own classes. You do, you know, you figure out... Dad gets there, and, and there's a bazillion people. Uh, okay, it wasn't, but still, from what he was used to. And uh, he said they, they put him in typing class. <laughs> and he, he sat there with all these, these ladies and other guys that, that could just fly on the typewriter, and he was one finger. And he said, this is, this is not going to work. So he calls the coach. And I'm sorry, I cannot remember the coach here at EKU at that time. It doesn't matter. He calls the coach. At Eastern, and said, uh, "Hey, Spider Thurman here. I don't like UK. I want to come to Eastern. You do? Yeah. And and this was before really anything started, and they could transfer. So he, uh, the coach said, okay, go down to the Black Brothers bus line, which is long gone. There'll be a ticket waiting for you. Get on the bus, come to Richmond, and I'll pick you up. And so he did. And so he literally hid Dad out." In Richmond, wow. because the next day, the UK football coach was calling over here. Have you seen Spider Thurman? And the coach, <laughs> who? No, I haven't seen him <laughs> until until Dad got registered in school and started practicing, and that's how he started at Eastern. That's a wow. great story. <laughs> I love great. that. I love it. Well, you graduated here in '69, so you were you were on campus with with Dr. Martin as yes. as president. Yes. So I have to ask you. I would be remiss not to ask you if you have any good stories about any interactions with President Martin. Because he, so, he was so larger than life, right? He was just a larger than life oh, figure. Yeah. And you talk, that, you talk about a force on campus. Oh, yeah. I mean, you didn't have to be afraid of anybody or anything except Dr. Martin. And if Dr. Martin had your back, you didn't have to worry about anything else. Uh, absolutely. And uh, Dr. Martin... Uh, just one of the most phenomenal individuals that I've ever had the pleasure to to meet. And a a real embarrassing thing. Okay, I remember it popped into my head. Real embarrassing. I know you're smiling. You like embarrassing stuff. Okay, I'll tell it. (laughs) We're in the uh, the old cafeteria, uh, second floor of um, Student Union building. Student Union. That's where the cafeteria used to be. Mm -hmm. And so we go in. I, I go up to eat lunch one day with Dad. And Dr. Martin is sitting there by himself. So Dad uh, said, come on, Tommy, let's go over here and uh, we'll, we'll sit with Dr. Martin. And so we get over. I put my food down. And uh, Dad introduces me. And I stick out my hand to, to to shake Dr. Martin's hand. And what do I do? I hit my glass of water, and it goes all over the place. <laughs> and that's my, my introduction to Robert Martin. Oh, Dad, I didn't do such a good job on that. Ah, don't worry about it. Was so Dr. Martin okay? Or, oh, you know, yeah. He was, he was yeah. all right with he, it? He just, he, he just looked at me and he kind of smiled. He didn't mm-hmm. laugh. He just kind of looked at me. He, serious individual, okay? 
And you kind of looked at me, kind of smiled, and said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier about you getting into the, uh, to, uh, what is it, uh, political science. You majored in political science. How did you kind of get into, how did you decide on that? Because you said you didn't know what you were going to do. Uh, that pretty straightforward answer, actually. Uh, in, in high school, uh, I, I truly did not want to know what I was majoring in, wanted to major in, at Madison High, which is now Madison Middle, mm-hmm. uh, the school on the hill. And um, I thought I, would, I wanted to major in a science field. So I had four years of science and four years of math at, uh, at Madison. And I, I thought that um, I wanted to go into chemistry. I liked labs. I liked that type of analytical work. And uh, I, I was not really that, that great in math, uh, so I don't know if I could ever go on that way. But honestly, I, I, I took chemistry in the high school, and I just didn't get it. And it scared the bejesus out of me. And I thought, how can I go to college and take chemistry when I can't understand high school chemistry? And, okay, there could be some reasons here, but I'm not going that direction. So um, I started thinking, okay, what what else can I do? And I had um, a number uh, of relatives that were attorneys. At that time, uh, my cousin, uh, Bill Robbins, was the county attorney, and so you know Huey Robbins and mm-hmm. and the whole Robbins were relatives. So um, I started thinking about being an attorney. So I would go talk to Bill, and I said, "Okay, maybe this is what I want to do." So that's why I majored in in political science, thinking that got out of college, I'd go to to law school and and go on from from there. Um. There were a few sidetracks in the road. Um, when I was here, um, I remember very distinctly that, um, oh, let, let me go back. At that period of time in ROTC, all the freshmen and sophomores had to take ROTC, mandatory. So at the end of my sophomore year, uh, and I'm still taking poli sci, mm-hmm. uh, dad sat me down one day and he says, I got a couple of questions for you. Okay. Uh, what do you think about this ROTC stuff? I said, yeah, it's okay, Dad. I, you know, I, I like it. That, that's fine. He said, well, let me give you some advice. And I really took notice. Because, and as much as I love Dad, he loved my brother and I, he just didn't give us a lot of advice. It's kind of like, okay, you make your own way. So when he's saying he's going to give you some advice, it's like, uh, you better pay attention because <laughs> this, is, this is unusual. He said, look, if this Vietnam War thing, is still going on when you graduate, and it was, it's better to go in the military as an officer rather than essentially e-nothing. And I said, point taken. And he said, also, uh, you get $50 a month in the ROTC program at that time, which was a lot of money, um, and you go to summer camp and you get paid at summer camp, yada, yada, yada. I said, okay. And he said, and you don't want to go to OCS, Officer Candidate School. He said, that's what I did. He said, that is not fun. Not fun at all. Okay, so I qualified, thankfully, to get into the advanced program. So I go through four years of ROTC, graduate, I'm commissioned as a second lieutenant. And I have a mandatory two years at, at that point. So I go in the military and my first military assignment is with a, a very unique type of unit, and it had a lot of explosives to do with it. We had some bomb disposal people there, and I started going out on the range with these guys. I said, oh, this is cool. This is beyond cool. And I, and I made a middle note that if I decide not to go to law school, this is what I want to do. So as time goes on, I'm trans, uh, I get a transfer not to Vietnam, but I'll go to Korea. And in Korea, uh, after about nine months in Korea, I started thinking about law school. I think mainly do I want to go back back to school. It's like, no, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I do, do not. So I had a battalion commander that had that was former EOD, bomb disposal, military, and I said, 
um, Colonel, I think I want to stay in the military and I want to go to EOD school. And so that's that's was the divergence. I went away from the EOD, uh, came back from Korea in 71, summer of 71, and went directly into EOD school, which was six months long, and never looked back. And it was, in, in that school, um, it was exactly what I had been looking for in high school, what I'd been looking for in college. It's like, this is what you're meant to be. And, and I was, you know, um, even though I minored in English, and then, okay, I minored, okay, when I graduated, I had done student teaching uh, in, um, for high school and had all this stuff. But the, that technical world just absolutely set me on fire. And, and I've, I've told my students here at, at Eastern in, in the classroom, I said, and I told them over and over, I hope that you find a career that is all-consuming to you. And I said, what I mean by that is that I was a mediocre student when I was in, in, at EKU. And you know, I, I did okay. You know, I, I, I didn't burn anything up with my grades. Okay, that's all right. I get to EOD school, and you're in school for eight hours a day, and it's just I couldn't wait for the next topic to come up because it was just I was absorbing this like the proverbial sponge. At night, we'd have to go back to the building to study because it was all classified stuff, you know. And on the weekend, not every weekend, but, uh, well, most every weekend, put it this way, at least one day I'd go in and spend eight hours in the classroom studying. And, and I, I, I would tell my kids that I loved it so much, I couldn't wait to learn more and more and more of the subject matter and that it wasn't work. It was absolute fun. And I'll tell you, I really, really hope that you find that type of profession that you can't get enough of it. And it just, it all consuming for you. And that's, that's where all my explosives and everything started was right there. Wow. Um, when you, when I hear the uh, term bomb disposal, my pop culture mind immediately goes to the movie Hurt Locker. What is, what is that life like? Okay. Uh, the Hurt Locker movie is a bunch of crock. <laughs> Absolutely total. Um, the, the training that the people get, the tools that they were using, uh, real world, right? real world stuff. However, what it was showing in the Hurt Locker, um, an EOD technician could in most any place, but particularly Afghanistan and Iraq, you could do that one time. One time, you could walk down on something, uh, a possible IED, and start jerking wires and pull up, if you remember, the projectiles that had detonating cord going from... You could, put, you could do that one time. The next time, the bad guys would be waiting for you, and they'd have a secondary device that would be remote control, whether it would be by radio control or by wire, and you'd be dead. I am, and that is not a, um, just a glorification on my part. That happens. Absolutely. You, you, as a technician... You do not do things over and over as a pattern because bad guys out there, they're not dumb. They're smart, sometimes smarter than you are. And you've got to figure out how not to get killed. Very true. So you're in the Army in, in EO, EO, EOD school, which yeah. is Explosive Ordnance Disposal. disposal. Okay, see, I, I had the explosive in the ordinance. I didn't have the disposal. <laughs> um, so well, why did you not decide to stay? How did you tr- – yeah, well, I can't talk. Let me let me reverse that and, and rewind and ask that again. Um, kind of where – how did you get into the FBI from there? Like what caused you not to stay in the Army to get out of the Army and go 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 the FBI direction? When, when I – was um, was in Korea. I had responsibility. I, I was in a an ammunition uh, company, an ammunition battalion, and I was uh, initially a maintenance platoon leader responsible for uh, a bunch of guys that were that were working on trucks and vehicles. And then uh, the last four months, because I was staying in the military, the the colonel. Uh, and I got along really, really well, and he gave me a command 
as a lieutenant of a company of an ammunition. And so um, I didn't have to worry about maintenance anymore, but I had to worry about the ammunition aspects and everything. And there were, suffice to say, there was a lot of personnel issues. And I couldn't be technical for dealing with personnel issues. And so, and I don't want to, you know, there's no reason to go any deeper than that. So um, I go into EOD, and I'm in EOD for uh, about three years. And at, at that point, I've been in the military for, what, five, six years. And the uh, personnel branch calls and said, well, you're, you're getting ready to, uh, to be rotated out of your EOD unit. I had a, an EOD unit at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, which is right outside of D.C., and which is a phenomenal, phenomenal place, um, and said, you're going to go to the, to the career course. And the career course uh, would be a, a type of course that would qualify you to then be promoted to field grade. I was a captain at that time. It a mandatory training. Okay. And I said, uh, okay. And I said, well, what would be my assignment out of the career course? Uh, you would probably go in a maintenance or an ammunition battalion staff. And I go, Ooh. I didn't tell him. I said, no, 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 no. I said, how about EOD? I stay in, let me stay in the EOD. I, I love this. No, it's not a career field. And you've got a really, really bright future in the military. And we're here to try to help you, and you'll go in to be a staff officer and then be promoted to be an executive officer. And, and I'm thinking, bye-bye, EOD. So I said, okay, well, thank you very much. I hung up the phone. I said, that's it. i got to find a job. So it took uh, two, over two years to um, – well, for, first of all, I was in shock. And so I had to sit around, okay, what in the Sam Hill am I going to do? I can't stay in the military. I love what I was doing. And I had a lot of friends that were agents with uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. I had uh, friends that, uh, well, I worked at that time uh, within the military with the Secret Service for presidential protection. And so I knew the Secret Service really well. So I thought, okay, the Secret Service would be a good career. But then uh, I had some friends that were in the FBI laboratory, the, the unit chief, uh, phenomenal guy by the name of Fred Smith, bless his soul, he's, he's passed on. And we got to be really good friends, and, and I told him my quandary. And he said, come in as an agent. And I said, well, don't you have to be an accountant or an attorney? Oh, no, 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 that's what they say in the press. But that's, no. He said, imagine what the bureau would be with accountants and attorneys. That's all we had. <laughs> uh, he's, no, 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 that wouldn't work. So um, – Ultimately, and it was a long process, oh my goodness, and I didn't think I was going to get in, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but thankfully, uh, October 17, 1977, uh, I was sworn in as a, as a special agent trainee. And they didn't give us credentials, they gave us the gold badge, and um, as partial identification at that point. And off to Quantico I went for uh, 16 weeks. Um, graduated out of Quantico, and I got my credentials, uh, got my gun, and off I went to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina as my first office. I was there for three years as a criminal investigator, and because of my background in the field of explosives, uh, I was transferred to Fred Smith's old unit. He had retired in the FBI laboratory back in Washington, D.C., where I essentially stayed for 17 years. Wow. So... How did you decide that, you know, to go into the forensic investigation side of it as opposed to the disposal side of it? Because uh, <laughs> obviously in the EOD, you were, you were kind of more involved in the disposal side, I'm guessing, right, with that kind of training? Yes. Uh, and Well, it's a lot safer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a lot safer. And, uh, and, and I say this, kind of almost a cliche. But no, I... I had uh, five years as an active EOD officer and put six months as, in training, so I, I figured uh, five and a half, six years in EOD. And I went out and I, I had disarmed bombs, uh, not military munitions. Well, I didn't some of that, but improvised IEDs. And uh, I started thinking, well, what happens next? 
how do you catch the person who built the bomb? Where, where, where does that go? And that, that really, really set me on fire. And when I went in the Bureau, you know, I wasn't thinking so much of, of the forensics at that point. I was thinking, okay, I want to be a criminal investigator. I want to go out and do the investigations and find enough evidence uh, of the crime uh, to then take people off the street and so that they would not be uh, a hazard to, to other people out in the, in the community. And, and with that, in the, in the Charlotte Division, because of my background in explosives, um, they made me what they call the bombing coordinator of the division. So if there was a bombing or something forensics on that side, even though I didn't have the forensic background at that point, they would ask me about the explosives. I'd go out and do the investigations and, and send the evidence to the lab and that type of thing. And so it, at that point, on the second side, it really started piquing my interest of, you know, I want to go further, further with this, and um, and then transferred to the laboratory uh, division. And in the laboratory, uh, our responsibilities were to get in uh, the remains of explosive devices and examine those devices, uh, the remains, identify the components, reconstruct the device in the form of a laboratory report, and how to identify those device, those components. Uh, how the device logically functioned, and those components, how they work together to form the fusing system to cause it to to explode. Essentially, reverse engineering. All of it is reverse engineering. And again, it's just like when I was saying in, in EOD school that I really loved the, the whole explosives field and learning about military munitions and how they worked and how they were developed and what they did. It's just, it's just unbelievable. Then I get to the, get into the laboratory and it, it was, it was absolutely the, the epitome of, of forensics. And at that time I wanted to go further with it. So I went to George Washington university at night school to get my master's in, in forensic science because I, okay, I want to know more about what's going on. And, and the good thing about, GW is that we'd have classes, and if I really didn't totally understand what they were talking about, there was in fact an expert in the laboratory that I'd go talk to and say, oh, the professor's not really clear here. What is he talking about? And I'd sit down and we'd talk about stuff. And, um, and I just, I was only supposed to stay in the laboratory for six years. At the end of six years, you know, I could opt out. But at the end of six years, Shoot, they had the laboratory had me hook, line, and sinker. I mean, there's no way I wanted to go anyplace else. I was having, and I hope people listening can understand this. I was having the time of my life, but at the same time, understanding the time of my life in, in examining these was a result of a bomb exploding, mm -hmm. people getting hurt, and people getting killed. So I absolutely understood that side. And the other thing that we, when we get the evidence in, we, we, we weren't there, and, and I'm going to make a point of this because sometimes people just don't understand this part. Yeah, I mean, we want to catch the bad guys, but we examine the evidence, and if the evidence is not there, we don't make it up. I mean, it, what, it is what it is, and we were, comp all of us in, in, in the unit, were completely... 100% non-biased about, you know, what was there. Okay, it, it's this. And that's what the, the, and that's what the device is. And uh, uh, I would go out and testify in, uh, in state and federal court, not to say that the individual that is the defendant built this bomb. I mean, one time I did that, okay. But all the other testimonies, I was part of the prosecution and to say that as an expert, and I would be qualified as an expert in the field of improvised and explosive devices, that these components here constituted an exploded improvised explosive device as a point of law, period. That's 99% of, of what we did when we would go in to testify. And then as time went on, 
Uh, I know I'm going much further than than your question, which is oh, okay, you're fine. fine. Which is okay. I'm sorry, it's kind of me. <laughs> no, you're uh, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, keep going. Uh, as, as as time goes on, our cases start to change, and they started changing in the the winter of 1983 from uh, state cases and FBI cases of terrorism and things in the United States outside the United States. And and I, I tell people, in my opinion, and if people want to disagree, that, that's fine. It, it's just my opinion, that the whole world of international terrorism for the United States changed forever on in December of 1983 when some terrorists uh, blew up uh, a bomb or truck bomb outside the U.S. Embassy in, Ku- Embassy in Kuwait City. Everything changed after that. We started seeing in April 18 of 19... Uh, um, no, I'm sorry, that was 82, 1982. In April of 1983, uh, the American embassy was literally blown up in Beirut, Lebanon. In Lebanon, yeah. And um, another um, forensic investigator and I went over. I was the second man. He was much more qualified than me, and he showed me how to do you know these big big scenes and uh, then that fall uh, October of 83 we had the bombing of the Marine Corps barracks at the airport in Beirut then the next year we had uh, the second embassy was blown up in Beirut and it just went on and on and on to where it is today and it, it's it, it's unbelievable what's happened in what now 30 years, 35 years, how terrorism has, has taken over. And my, my point being here, that 20 years ago, thereabouts, if you would ask somebody on the street, uh, what's an IED? Uh, I don't have a clue. Today, mm-hmm. everybody knows an IED is a homemade bomb. Mm-hmm. That's how things have changed. It's very true. Um, let's see. Uh, tell me how, like, technology has changed the way you find uh, criminals who create these bombs. Oh. For terrorists. Jeez. Um, yeah, because I'm sure that the technology that you were using in the yeah. in the 80s to catch these 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 guys is is just drastically changed. It, uh, more than you can ever imagine. Which, to tell you the truth, it's it's amazing to me that you all, in that time period, you know, with the the embassy bombings and and the you know the Pan Am uh, flight 103 and all that, were able to piece this stuff together to catch these guys. Well, we, for the most part, and, and there's exceptions, and I can go down all the. There, there's a lot of exceptions here. Mm-hmm. We in the explosives unit really didn't go out. And and catch the bad guys. What what we what we did, and again some exceptions, um, we examined the explosive device with the idea, as I said a minute ago, to identify the components. And those specific components we would describe in detail, and hopefully a brand name or manufacturer or something like that of that. So that report would go back to the the field wherever, whether it would be a, a, a state organization, a municipal, or the FBI. Then they could then see those components uh, being identified. Then they go out to the stores. They start doing the shoe leather express of running down those leads and saying, okay, go into an uh, electronic store that's around that. Has anybody bought this, these type of materials here? So, again, we didn't do it in the lab. But we what we hope what we tried to do is that as well as we could identify those components so that they could, the field investigators could take that information and then try to tie an individual or individuals back to those components. That's the way the case works. And to, to identify the components, okay, most of them were easy to identify. Uh, that this is this type of switch or this item. What was hard to do sometimes was determine who manufactured those. So you can be very, very specific. 
And the way that <laughs> that, that we identified those, now, I mean, there's different levels here. So let's say electronic components elect, or le- electronic electrical. Because most fusing systems at that time um, had batteries and wires and, and that type of thing. So I had a number of catalogs <laughs> on my desk uh, from electronic manufacturers and stuff that I would have to turn through page after page looking for stuff. Hey, oh, yeah, it took a long time. It did. It took a long time. In today's world, and I'm leaving a lot out here, uh, all that's online. And just like my, my students here at, uh, at, at EKU and in, in the investigations program, we blow up stuff and, the, and they go in, they process the scene, and they identify things really, really quickly. Um, and they have to write the reports and, and say, okay, this is how the thing uh, exploded that we believe. And they go online, they just have a partial number and just start doing offline searches for number, partial or a name. And within a few seconds, they bring it up. It's like, oh, this is not hard at all anymore. And it's just, it's technology is just, it's a two-edged sword, okay? The internet, technology, uh, resources, two-edged sword. The good part is on the forensic side, it makes it easier to identify componentry and sometimes where it came from. On the bad side, you've got people that, go in the internet to find out how to build a bomb. Sure, yeah. Well, let me ask you this. And our, our students here in, in the program at EKU are, are great. And the, the program is really unique. And it's, you know, it's really interesting, I think, in terms of what it's, what it's doing. But do you think your students would be as effective using the paper? Do you think they could do it? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and I... And I, I uh, I would say this, that if they are invigorated, that they have tenacity, they could do it on paper just as well as doing it on the Internet. It's just it would take a long time, much longer. Sure. Yeah. Huh? So you retired uh, in 1998. Is that right from the FBI? Yes. Was that, yeah. So kind of what, and I know you, you, you do lectures and you're still lecture um, on the subject and, and that kind of thing, but kind of what brought you back around to teaching, uh, especially here at EKU? Actually, mom and dad. Um, I, um, I, I started considering what I was going to do in, in my retirement days from, from the FBI. And the thing with the FBI, uh, and it's, it's a law enforcement, uh, federal law enforcement, we have a mandatory retirement age at uh, 57. And um, a lot of people in the Bureau uh, do stay on until they're 57 and retire. But most of those people that that do that are the people in the field divisions. Let's say that they're in the Louisville field division, maybe work in Lexington, and they're going to make Lexington home. So, hey, why do I want to retire before I really have to? Because I'm staying here anyway. Um, and most of the retirees that, that I knew would, would do that. They would, they would stay till mandatory retirement and then retire. Well, I was in DC and my mandatory retirement and, and okay, I, I love DC, but I didn't want to stay in DC. Yeah. I don't blame uh, you. <laughs> too much traffic. Traffic. I was going to say traffic is, traffic is awful. We'll just leave Way it at that. Much. Traffic yeah. is awful. And, um, both my, my wife and I. Uh, had a desire to to get out of there because I had been there for a long time. Uh, she grew up partially there in in Northern Virginia, and she wanted to go back where the pace of life was a little bit slower. And so I started thinking about okay, what am I going to do in retirement? Uh, I've got a lot of possibilities, and I would come back home uh, here. I always con- considered Richmond home, and I'd visit with mom and dad and and talk with mom and dad, and, well, I don't know what you, and mom would say, well, come to Eastern and teach. Well, I don't know that they, they don't, they wouldn't want somebody like me up here. And said, well, you know, you get, you got uh, a number of programs here. And then one day dad uh, showed me the, uh, the fire and arson program that uh, Ron Hopkins had started. 
uh, 20 years before I got here. He started w within uh, the fire science program, fire and arson investigation, uh, along with uh, fire admin and, and so on. So um, a couple of years before I was eligible to retire, um, I was here on, on vacation, and I thought, well, maybe I'll just go up and talk to the dean of, uh, at that time, college law enforcement, Truett Ricks. And uh, I, I said, Dad, you want to go? He said, yeah, come I, Yeah, I'll go with you. So this, I, I, I can't be more specific. It was meant to be, absolutely meant to be. And the, way, the reason I say that is you, you, you know how busy deans are. It's like uh, you will get an appointment next week or maybe next month. I walked in, and he wasn't busy. I walked right in his office. I, I, I talked with uh, his secretary. Yeah, he's not going on, go on in. And I sat down with him and introduced myself. He knew that, of course. And we started talking, and, and he said, uh, basically, what are you here? You know, what are you here for? And I said, well, I've been thinking about retirement, and I know that you've got a phenomenal fire and arson program. Have you ever thought about expanding that to explosives? And he said, no. <laughs> well, okay, well, what, what are you thinking here? And I said, well, look, um, to my knowledge, there is no academic accreditation anywhere in the world on post-blast investigation, the explosives field. Okay, there's, there's academics out there purely academics and chemistry of explosives and that type of thing. But for crime scene investigation, uh, finding the evidence, what I've been doing for twenty over 20 years, because I, I did some of that in the FBI, so I say over 20 years, um, no academic accreditation. And I said, I think that would be a big pull for the program, that you go fire, arson, and explosives investigation. And so a few minutes conversation turned into, honestly, three hours long. Wow. We sat there and talked about this for three hours, what I had done, uh, what I thought I could teach, how it would, would interact. And at the end, he says, okay, I want your resume. <laughs> After three hours, he still <laughs> wants your resume. He said, I want your resume. He said, you, he said, I want to do this. He said, you've convinced me. And I said, well, I, don't, I can't retire right now. He said, oh, Tom. <clears throat> He says, the university is slower than, I'm not going to know what, what he said, yeah, but it's, okay, it's slower slow. Slower molasses. It's slow, but he didn't say molasses. He said something else. But he said, it's really slow. And um, you um, give me your resume, give me your ideas, and we'll start running them around here and see what we can do. And honestly, you know, like two years, two and a half years later, um, Excuse me. They started the program. They got the program approved by the Board of Regents. Then they uh, put out an advertisement for a professor. And guess what? I got hired. <laughs> I got hired. So um, I moved home again. And um, people, you can't move. You can't go home again. Wrong. Um, and I, um, I, I just. That's what I'm saying. The circumstances of that, it just, it was meant to be. It was that day, he was not doing anything, he was open to suggestions, and I had, I had done my homework and walked in and said, how about this? And that's where, where it started. Well, and, and I think that you're kind of a, an example of a, a lot of people who have done that in terms of went to EKU, loved it, went, did something amazing in their career and were able to bring it back to EKU because you loved it so much. Perfect. A absolutely. And, and that, that, that's exactly um, why I came here in addition to being back here with mom and dad. Um, very, very close to mom and dad. And uh, our son at that time was uh, six years old. And so I saw the opportunity where he could really get to know his grandparents. And my grandmother was still alive at that point, living with mom and dad. And she lived to 99 and so many months. <laughs> yeah. So uh, 
uh, my son Christopher uh, got to know his grandmother and mom and dad really, really well. And although you haven't asked it, I'll tell you. All right. uh, <laughs> Christopher graduated EKU. Uh, he was in the honors program, graduated with honors, and left here, went to graduate school at the University of Denver, and graduated uh, in his master's program um, in the field of uh, international affairs and development. And he's working for a nonprofit in D.C. as we oh, speak. Wow. Yeah. So he's dealing with the traffic. Yes, he is. <laughs> well, not, no, he's not. He oh. takes the subway. Ah, uh, okay. He takes, he takes okay. the subway Smart. Every, uh, every day. But, um, but uh, my older daughter graduated from EKU. All right? So it's, it's really like... Legacy. In the, fam- in the family it, here? That's exactly it's, right. It's, it's the family. Exactly. It's mom, it's dad, uh, and then myself, uh, my daughter, my son. Yep, all EKU. Love it. Love it. Uh, if you have, if somebody came up to you and asked you, why should I go into uh, the, part, the Department of Safety, Criminal Justice, or Fire, Arson, and Explosives, do you ha- would you have any advice for them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, we're very proud of, of our program and programs, if you will, mm-hmm. on if you, the other side of campus. You know, yeah. <laughs> people are, the other side of campus. Uh, oh, the other side of campus that doesn't have parking problems. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's bigger parking lots over on the other side of campus. That's right. Um, we, we teach real world skills to where, and if you, if you like that type of problem solving, or if you want to be a firefighter, or if you want to be a, a safety professional. We teach real-world skills where when you graduate, you're qualified to do something. You know, and, and I'm, not, please, I'm not taking away from other programs or anything else, but it is real-world skills. Uh, we teach people, um, you know, Greg Gorbett, uh, the coordinator, uh, he teaches fire and arson investigation. And what, what we mean by that is that you're going in and looking at the patterns of the fire and reading those patterns and coming to a conclusion, uh, if, po- if possible, sometimes you can't do it, of uh, the cause and origin of that fire. So it's, it's a skill that, and that, that you're learning. In the explosives field, in the investigation, we're teaching uh, students how to find this evidence and make something out of it. It's... What I've told the student, and, and I'll get more, more specifically here in just a minute, it's solving a puzzle. You go out and find these puzzle pieces, and you have no idea what the, the picture is, and you start assembling this puzzle until all of a sudden, here's the picture. And whether it is the cause of that fire, which could be many, many things, or here's the fusing system of the IED. Okay, fusing system is what caused the explosions to go bang. Whatever's there. Um, so if, if they like challenge, if a person likes challenges, they like to work with their hands, they like to have analytical thinking, um, they like to either work with by themselves or even work in teams, this is the field to go in, or fields, I and mean, there's multiples to, to go into. Well, and I tell you what, I really think that EKU's program is unique in terms of what it teaches. Uh, especially in it, just in the United States, um, I don't think there's probably very few programs that are that are like it. But to, to my knowledge, uh, that there's one similar program uh, in Oklahoma, but the only people that are in that program are active duty uh, fire investigators, police, and so on. The what we have is unique, not only in the United States, it's unique in the world. There's no other program like this in the world where we're taking undergraduate students with limited knowledge. Now, some, some of them come in with knowledge because they've been volunteer firefighters. Sure, yeah. But essentially, they come in with limited knowledge, and we're exposing them to this whole litany of hands-on visual instruction. Absolutely. Well, i got to say, you literally wrote the book on bomb scene investigation, right? 2006, it got published, um, Practical Bomb Scene Investigation. It's 500-plus pages. What kind of prompted you to write this extensive book? 
Well, as, as a as a plug for the book, uh, there is the 2017 third edition now. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, All right. Third edition. Third edition's out. See, there. the internet didn't tell me that. I didn't realize that. <laughs> third edition. Um, two reasons. One is the academic reason that uh, there was no effective textbook for uh, explosion investigations. Nothing there. Um, the other reason is that I wanted folks that do these investigations in the United States, worldwide, to take this book and use it as a resource in order to more effectively assess the scene, organize their their, uh, priorities at that scene, and be able to recover evidence at that scene to send it to a laboratory or do the exams themselves. Some people are doing their own exams. Uh, I don't really like that, but that's that happens. Um, I'd rather they send it to a laboratory. Um, and so that the perpetrator of that incident would be more readily identified. And I'm, I'm very proud to say that, that the book has gotten international uh, recognition, um, specifically the, the country of Australia, all eight states, and the federal uh, government in Australia recognize uh, practical bomb scene investigation as best practices. Oh wow, that's and that's amazing. It, it's yeah. used it's it's used in State Department schools. Uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms and explosives have been using the book, and that's exactly what I wanted it to be. It, it's it's not. Um, you know, I wanted to take the, my knowledge and the knowledge I've gained from other people and give back to the community of what they have given me. Absolutely, yeah. And that and that was one way that um, I felt that that we could that we could do that. Or I could do that. Sure, sure. Well, I'm not quite sure how to transition into this <laughs> now. Um, but it's t- that time in our program for our segment called Colonel Quickfire. Uh-oh. And so Uh-oh. this this is this is a segment. It's I'll do three questions and Brady has three questions, so it's a total of six. So I'll do one and then he does one. Um, you can answer one word answer. You can do one sentence. You could elaborate. We've had people do it all kinds of different ways. I never stumped anybody on season one, so <laughs> don't be the first to get to get stumped. No, these are really fun. They're fun, easy questions. So I will go ahead and get started. What is your favorite class or subject to teach? <laughs> Did I already stump you? <laughs> oh no, no. It, it, I guess the the. My favorite class is the entry level uh, FSC 250 into fires and explosion investigation uh, because it has a, a, a multitude of subjects. Uh, I mean, I, I love teaching all of it, but in in that class, we not only have majors from uh, fire from fire and explosion investigation, we also have fire admin majors, and about a third of the class uh, criminal justice and police studies majors, and. I really like teaching that because I'm teaching the basics of uh, dynamics of explosives, uh, identification of explosive materials, and um, a number of other things that that are in there that relate directly not only to the investigation, but also to um, criminal justice majors that they could be faced with these hazards out out in the field. So I, I open that up to them and... All of them said they, they love love the class. Uh, let's see. What would your favorite place on campus be? With This could be whether when you were a undergrad or now. Oh, <laughs> I guess, okay, I, I can, uh, as an undergrad, my favorite place on campus was the Ravine uh, because I could, I could sit with uh, buddies in the Ravine, and that, that was a, at that time, was place where people con- you know, congregated. Mm-hmm. And I could look at all the good-looking women that would come <laughs> into the ravine. All right? and, you know, it, was a, it was a great place. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Since you are from Richmond, or at least you, know, you grew up in Richmond partially and you went to EKU in undergrad, Jackson's or Mall Kelly's? So these are two, in case people don't know, these are two kind of like 
stalwart. Uh, Mall Kelly's isn't here anymore, but you know these were the kind of the two restaurants in town that you could go get a home cooked meal, sit down, you know, for fairly cheap, yep. right? So Jackson's or Mall Kelly's or both, you could do both. I'd accept both. As in, which is better? Uh, which or, you would prefer? Like if you, so if somebody uh, said Mall Kelly, Mall Kelly's. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that I, I don't know. In, in fact, I, I'll, I'll go out on the limb. You could not have that restaurant today because I, I'm sorry to say on the negative side, people take advantage because just like, okay, what, what did you, what did you have? And they left it up to the patron, uh, to be honest with what they had. And, uh, I mean, yeah, that was, that was one phenomenal place. It's what, uh, but yeah, Kelly. All right. Uh, what's your favorite EKU story? That you might have. Oh, I, I guess my my all time favorite story is what I've already related to you about Dad, mm-hmm. about Dad being at UK and the football coach hit him out here until he <laughs> <laughs> until it was too late for him to go back to UK. Uh, and just I, I love that. That is my favorite story. All right, a good one. This is this is my last one. So what? If somebody, you know, is new to Kentucky or is visiting here, what's, like, the one place you, you would tell them that they had to go in the state? Uh, Woodford Reserve Distillery. I like it. I like it. I like yeah. it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'd love to, sure, I'd love to take people to Woodford, uh, LaBerro and Graham, because I go through, I, I take them through the horse country and show them the barns, because I'm, I love Kentucky. I'm proud of central Kentucky. And people just can't believe it, that all the horse barns, and they say, that barn is nicer than my house. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And then where where that distillery is located in the Little Valley, and it's just a beautiful, iconic uh, Kentucky place. It really is. So I think Brady has one more. Yep. Uh, What does it mean to be a colonel? What it means to be a colonel is to... Love EKU uh, and the whole EKU experience of being here, of meeting new friends, of meeting people, husband and wives, they they find each other here, of going to to sporting events, uh, basketball games and football games and cheering on EKU. And just getting hoarse and screaming and, and having having a great time. And most of the time, I, I think that people don't really know as they move through the four years or five years what is happening until they're gone. And they see that that was the colonel experience, the whole totality of being here and growing, literally growing the mind, the body. And when you, when you leave here, uh, of still ha- of having this, this love for what you've learned, the people that you've met, and, and being in, in, on the EKU campus, we've got a cool, cool campus. It's not like some of the other schools where, like it, many places at UK, you don't know if you're downtown Lexington or on campus at UK. I, and people that you like, I, I'm sorry, but you know the, the campus is just it's all over. Mm-hmm. And being here on on Eastern's campus, you know you're here, and it's it, it's just a great place to be. And I totally agree with that, and I think that's why so many of our alumni return to to teach here, to live here, to work here, and and just in general to visit. That's why I think that's why our homecoming is so awesome. Yeah, because oh, yeah. so many yeah. of our alumni just they. they take to heart just what you said and they come back because they, they love it so much. Yeah. So there you go. I like it. All right. See, that wasn't too bad, was it? No. 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 That's that easy. That was the easy part. <laughs> well, Tom, I tell you what, I really, really appreciate you joining us um, for season two, episode one of EKU Voices. It was a really interesting conversation. I've really enjoyed it. It's been my really. pleasure. It's Absolutely fa- my Fascinating. Pleasure. Just fascinating stuff. It's great. Um, and of course, Brady, thank you. For, hey, thank for being you. my new co-host. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I think you did a great job on your first episode. 
And uh, I think we're going to have a fun season. I hope so. I think it's going to be great. I think it really is. Morgan, back as our student producer again from last season. Appreciate you. And uh, she's got a shadow this season. Uh, Emily is learning the ropes of running the board and running the Audacity program and all that good technical stuff. So glad to have y'all on board. And as always, you can find current and past episodes of EKU Voices on our webpage at alumni.eku.edu slash voices. Follow us on Twitter at EKU Voices. Follow EKU Development and Alumni Relations on all the social media platforms. And of course, subscribe to EKU Voices on iTunes to receive the newest conversations with Eastern Kentucky University's alumni and friends. So until next time, I'm Carrie Lewis. And I'm Brady McBride. And go Go Big big E. E.